One of the first things you notice about Buddhists in Thailand is that a lot of them wear amulets around their neck. When I first noticed this, I asked one of my friends why people wore amulets, and he said, for a sense of protection. So then I asked, well, what kind of protection do they give? And he said he didn't know about, about other people, but in his own case, the amulet was there to remind him. If he was going to do something unskillful, he could feel the amulet against his chest, reminding him that the Buddha would not appreciate or approve of what he was doing. And this is how the practice of mindfulness acts as a protection. A lot of passages in the kind of talk about it, that this is your refuge. You make the Dharma your refuge, you make yourself your refuge by practicing four establishings of mindfulness. And then practicing mindfulness, there's that passage with the acrobats. If you practice and devote yourself to the practice of mindfulness, you're protecting yourself and you're protecting others. And of course the protection there comes from the fact that mindfulness reminds you of how to look at your life in a way that you can then know what the skillful and unskillful things would be to do. Here, of course, mindfulness doesn't mean just being aware or non-reactive. It has its original meaning, the meaning from before the time of the Buddha and the meaning that the Buddha himself took on. It's a faculty of your memory. What makes mindfulness right is you remember the right things. For instance, the Buddha talks about the six sense spheres. And it's not just saying you watch sights or sounds or smells or tastes or tactile sensations arise and pass away. He says, you notice when you're creating a fetter by the way you look at things or the way you listen. And then you figure out how to let go of that fetter and how to arrange so it doesn't come back. So there's an active process, and it's reminding you, this is what you've got to watch out for. This is good to remember as you go home, visit your family. You don't want to forget the frames of reference. You don't want to forget the way to establish mindfulness. You don't want to forget their way of looking at things. You go home for the holidays. Desire comes up, greed comes up, and in the context of the family, okay, that's a good thing. After all, this is the, the holiday for greed, the holiday for everybody to get together and get a little bit drunk and be friendly, as if being drunk and going being friendly were two things that went together well. That's on a blatant level, but there are a lot of more subtle things going on, old stories and continuing narratives in the family. And it's all too easy to slip into those. And then a lot of people say, well, how do I fit Dharma practice into that context? Well, if Dharma practice fits into that context, it's not doing its job. It's going to create some awkward times and some awkward moments when you suddenly catch yourself doing something that you've done many, many times before, an old narrative, when it's called games people play with one another. And it's supposed to catch you and remind you, oh, this is not skillful. And you have to think of some other way of dealing with the situation. So rather than think of fitting Dharma practice into that context, try to fit that situation into Dharma practice. In other words, you hold the various frames of reference in mind. When a feeling comes up, they have pleasure or displeasure. You have to ask yourself, is this the kind of pleasure that will be good for the mind, or is it going to be bad? And you don't just say, well, this is the holiday season, and it's time to go along with the pleasure. No. Some pleasures are bad for the mind. Not all. There are a lot of pleasures that are good for the mind. And so you don't just watch pleasures and pains come and go. You have to figure out what kind of pleasure is going to be skillful. Remember the Buddha's teachings to Saka, the Deva. There's some forms of joy that are skillful and should be pursued, and there are other forms of joy that are not. 
Some pain should be pursued and others should not. Some forms of equanimity should be pursued and others should not. Remembering that our feelings are not just handed to us ready-made. As the Buddha said, there's an element of fabrication in terms of which feelings you're going to focus on, which ones you're going to ignore. That you actually turn in, when you focus on things, you actually turn them into full-fledged feelings. So how are you going to fabricate something skillful out of the pleasures of being home? That's what the protection of mindfulness reminds you of, and that's how it protects you. And this is how we lose our compass, or the practice loses its momentum when you go home. You take on a different framework. The stories of the family, the stories of your friends, the stories of the ways you've been interacting with them and how this particular interaction is going to continue. If you hold that as a framework, then the Dharma gets shredded into little pieces. They can fit in here, fit in there, but they lack coherence. You've got to make the framework of the establishing of mindfulness, the framework with which you approach situations at home, at work. And that's how mindfulness protects you. It gives you things to remember. The same with mind states. We don't just watch passion come and go or aversion come and go. Some forms of passion are skillful, some are not. Being averse to doing something unskillful, that's actually a good aversion to have. And again, these are things that you can promote or you can demote depending on how they fit into the framework. So mindfulness doesn't hit you against the head or hit you against the chest. It's not like an amulet, but it should serve that purpose of reminding you what should be done, what shouldn't be done. Remember how the Buddha said he gave protection to all of his students. That was one of the duties of a teacher. And the protection he gave was giving them instructions on what should and should not be done. He said any teacher that didn't provide those instructions was not providing anything of worth, anything of value at all. And that's the protection. The shoulds that you really can hold to and trust. The should nots you can hold to and trust. So work on keeping these things in mind and developing your powers of mindfulness. And this is what formal practice is good for. Because the nature of the mind is that moments of attention come up and they last not all that long. And you have to pay attention again and pay attention again. If you're going to stick with something, you have to keep reminding yourself, this is what I want to work with. Now, it's mindfulness that, it's mindfulness that provides the thread that sews all those moments of attention together. And you can strengthen it with asking questions, taking an interest in what you're doing. So there's more motivation in to keep stitching, stitching, stitching those moments together. To realize this is a challenge. You're going out into the land of wrong views. Now do you keep right view together. And as I said, if everything goes smoothly, it's a sign that the Dharma is not doing its work. Because after all, the whole purpose of the Dharma is to get you to change. To abandon unskillful qualities, to develop skillful ones. That requires changing the way you do things. As the Buddha said, if people couldn't change the way they do things, there'd be no purpose in teaching them. The reason he saw that it was worthwhile in teaching was that people can change their ways. So hopefully the Dharma will bang up against some of your old habits while you're at home, make you rethink them. That's a sign that it's doing its work and providing you with the protection you need. 
because otherwise who's going to protect you? You're the one who has to protect your practice. The people around you are not there to protect your practice. They may even be taking pot shots at it. So you have to value your practice, value your state of mind, value, <clears throat> value the skillfulness of your actions. And John Lee's image is like having a bowl of good food. You want to protect it from the flies. When the Buddha's image is having a bowl of oil on your head. There's a beauty queen singing and dancing to one side, and there's a crowd of people getting all worked up about the beauty queen on the other side. And you're walking in between them. And there's a man behind you with a sword raised, and if a drop of that oil spills, he's going to cut off your head. And the Buddha asked him, would that man allow his attention to get diverted? Well, no. The beauty queen stands for all the, the nice things out there in the world, and the crowd, of course, stands for all of your defilements, wanting to get all the nice things. But it's your mindfulness of the body that provides you with a good foundation. That's what keeps the bowl of oil in balance. And then from the mindfulness of the body, you can be mindful of your feelings and mind states and the different lists of dharmas and mental qualities that give you guidance on what should and should not be done. If you protect them, they'll protect you. <laughs>